Hey, what's you happening, y'all? Christopher Griffith and Hammer here for your weekly mortgage bond market update to give you kind of an idea of what's going on since the last time that we spoke last week uh, in the mortgage interest rate market. We see your questions daily, all of you going through the process, constantly have concerns uh, around, am I being offered a fair offer, right? Doesn't have to be necessarily the lowest, the coldest beer in town, right? You're not looking to save the, you know, this hundred dollars over that, but you want to know that you're being offered something fair and you want to have an understanding of what the market's doing uh, week to week and how it's changing and how it may change here in the future if you're planning things coming up. So we do these calls to give you an idea, an opportunity to ask questions and insight from a person who follows it and uh, helps professionals in the industry, mortgage professionals specifically, follow the changes daily and throughout the day that exist in the mortgage interest rate or the mortgage bond market. So that said, Hammer, thank you. Welcome to the call again this week. Uh, appreciate the time to go over some stuff. Probably a lot to go over, huh? Yeah, there is a lot, Christopher. Um, and actually, what's been working well for us the last couple of weeks, if you are watching this on the replay and it's helping you, we want to know that it's helping you. So do us a favor. If you're watching on the replay, give us a hashtag replay in the comments. If you have any questions about what we cover today and you're watching on the replay, go ahead and put those comments down there and those questions down there. We do monitor this post and we will go ahead and come back and answer those for you. So it is important for us to know that we're serving you guys and helping all of you all to, you know, to get what you're looking for out of this. So that said, yeah. uh, Nathan, if you don't mind showing my screen, man, let's, let's go just uh, take a quick dive and give everybody a recap. So this is our conversation for May 11th and a quick overview of what happened this week and what we were expecting to happen and what happened last week. So just a quick recap for last week, rates were just a little bit higher on the week. Uh, average mortgage rates moved higher as markets were adjusting for the Fed's half a point rate increase. And we talked about that last week. You can always you know, reference back to that post. But what's most important to recognize is that when the Fed did raise policy rates, the rate that they raised is called the Fed funds rate. And it does trickle through the, the entire economy. It does affect the prime rate, which is generally associated with car loans, credit cards. Um, what other loans are, you know, home equity lines of credit. Most short-term credit is also tied to prime. So that we did see that move. But when the Fed raised that Fed funds rate, they raised it a half a percent. And some people were concerned that that meant mortgage rates were going to go up a half a percent. That is not the case. Mortgage rates are not directly impacted. Well, they're impacted, but they're not directly controlled controlled by the Fed. The Fed does not set mortgage rates. Mortgage rates are actually based on something called mortgage-backed securities or mortgage bonds, which are these fancy charts that we look at. We'll talk about a little bit today. But last week, we did see rates get just a little bit worse. It wasn't much at all, um, mainly later in the week. And uh, probably for most people that were locking in, it wouldn't be enough to really notice the difference, but there was a small movement. This week, we were really waiting to see how everybody would react to today's data. Today was inflation day. So there's actually a couple different kinds of inflation that we measure out there. And the first one that the Fed likes to look at is a certain gauge called the uh, cons the CPE, the uh, consumer, oh, it's funny, they're all leaving my brain today, the consumer price expenditure. And that one is a little bit different today is CPI, that's consumer price index. That's a, uh, uh, a little bit of a different one than the other one. But Bottom line, they're they're both showing inflation. It all shows inflation. So today we did see some inflationary readings. It was actually, though, a little bit less than what we saw last month, but it was still inflation going up. Markets didn't like that. So if you were pricing out loans, if you were looking to shop your interest rate yesterday and you get a new quote today, you're going to notice that quote may be higher. You may see a slightly higher rate. And that's why when you're shopping around, and should they shop around, Christopher? Always shop around. There's literally nothing else you can do to guarantee that you're seeing the most amount of opportunities to find the best deal. And the best deal always being somewhat relative. But if you're only looking at one thing, you're not going to know. And I'll tell you, if they're calling you by your rank to start the dialogue, you're probably not getting the most competitive deal out there just from experience. So always shop around, look at different places, different types of places, and make certain that the professional that you're working with understands the nature of the product that you have access to with a VA home loan because it's... It's complex, man. It's got a lot going on to it. And you have to really understand the ins and outs of it if you're going to use it frequently or work with it professionally to know what it's capable of. But if you do that and you shop, you're going to be set up for success.
Yeah. And the key to shopping is to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples by getting quotes right around the same time, because today's a perfect example. Yesterday's rate quotes would have been much rosier than this morning's, but not to worry because today's rates being higher, um, probably not going to last for too long. And we were concerned about that. Uh, let's go ahead and show you guys what kind of what happened on the chart. So uh, first, I'm going to reference a Bloomberg article. If we take a look, you'll see on Bloomberg, you got anybody can access Bloomberg. Um, you're going to see that there was some information about inflation this morning, and there were concerns that the inflation was still rising. Now, we've only seen one Fed rate increase that would have affected this report because this is data from last month and there was one quarter point Fed rate hike. The expectation is as the Fed continues to hike that Fed funds rate, it should increase the cost of borrowing and slow down the economy. We should see less spending and that should help bring inflation down, getting it closer to where the Fed wants it, which is right around 2%. So right now, uh, inflation actually came in at 8.3% annually, meaning it was about 8.3% higher than this time last year. And over month to month, it was 0.3% higher. If we take out energy and food costs, because they're very volatile, they call that the core consumer price index. And that was up 0.6%, which was slightly above the expectation of 0.4%. Don't get too caught up in the percents. What you want to recognize is inflation hasn't gone down yet. And the Fed is still expected to take action, raising rates a half a percent in June, expected also to raise rates a half a percent in July. Now, does that mean mortgage rates are going to go up a half a percent in June and a half so a percent? That's what I was going to say, though. This is the great irony of it. Everyone's like, oh, my God, the federal funds rates just went up. That means mortgage interest rates just went up by this. The greatest irony is by the time that that happens, everybody usually knows it's going to happen. The market, meaning all of the people that lend money, have generally priced in that adjustment already in advance of that, even if it was incrementally getting to that point, right, for that adjustment. And usually the very first thing that happens after that announcement is what, Hammer? That with it, mortgage interest rates, you'll actually like first, see a positive response. Yeah, yeah, you just, see, imp you see rates improve slightly for a period of time, right? Depending on, uh, you know, it may may not be that way if they're more aggressive than people anticipated or something, but that's usually not the case. The investors usually get the estimate of what they're going to do down fairly correctly. But that's the great irony. Don't freak out about the federal funds rate going up because usually the very first thing that happens is mortgage interest rates come down, even if it's just slightly for a short period of time. So we've we've shown this chart before, but to explain it to anybody who hasn't seen it before, this is a chart called a Japanese candlestick chart. And what we're monitoring are called mortgage-backed securities. And mortgage-backed securities are the way that we keep liquidity in the mortgage market. In other words, if I only had $100 million and I lent out all $100 million, I'll, then I don't have any more money. There's no more mortgages. Only the people who have mortgages can have those mortgages. Only when one of those gets paid off will I have more money to lend again. Well, that would be a pretty broken system because we wouldn't have many people with mortgages and houses. So in order to keep that money flowing, what happens is lenders and what you might call banks are actually taking your mortgage and they're securitizing it and selling it on Wall Street to investors who are buying that up so that they are making money on your interest. And they're able to keep liquidity. They keep buying more of these, which puts money back in so we can lend more money. And it's an ongoing circle. And when these mortgage bonds are selling for more money, mortgage rates are improved. When they are not selling for as much money and they're not as appealing, we find the coupon price goes up. And in order to entice more buyers, well, we have to give them a better interest rate. So it's just like you as a consumer. If I could put my money in a savings account and I get a half a percent, or I could put my money in a bond that gives me 3% and that money was safe. Well, I want to take that 3% over that half a percent. You want to get more money on your money. Same thing for investors. And they're going to weigh the risk of being in say the stock market, which is a risk on position because there is the risk that you could lose money, which is what's happening right now in stocks this year. And then there's the risk off position of bonds, which are more reliable. They're a guaranteed rate to return, but it's often going to be a much lower rate of return than a riskier investment. And, and their liquidity is tied up for longer. Yeah. I mean, it, to, to some degree, at least, even in how it works. But a lot, I think a lot of consumers, you know, think, well, why would I want, you know, why would I want to tie up a lot of money? But one of the biggest problems with money is having a lot of it, especially when you have inflation as it is right now. So investors are looking for places to achieve regular, reliable increase in growth to their money and liquidity pieces in certain marginalized risk ways too, whether they're really risky or non-risky and bonds are a very traditional 
non uh, super risky investment and because of amortized interest and kind of the nature of that they can still create a yield that allows the market to grow and expand in a healthy way so i want to show everybody what i drew these this little traffic jam these these traffic lanes that i drew on the, the screen today this first one that goes flat that was most of the second half of 2021 as mortgage bonds would move up or down rates would move very slightly but they stayed within a sideways range and sideways meaning it ran from side to side just like we see here east to west well then 2022 came and that was right about here that we saw 2022 and you could see that instead of running in this sideways pattern, it actually started to go down. And that trend, as these bonds went down in value, rates go up. It's an inverse relationship. So this is where you could see mortgage rates were going up and going up and going up and going up and going up. So why were mortgage rates going up? Uh, again, we're going to just give you a little bit of an oversimplification for time, but they went up because everybody was expecting that inflation would continue to rise and be a problem and that the Fed would need to slow down the economy and would have to raise rates. So if you are getting a 1% return today, but the Fed raises rates across the board you know, and, and uh, other things go up and next thing you know, you could have been getting 3 or 4%. Well, that 1% you're getting today doesn't look so good. And that's why you see the rates go up early. Mortgage rates, we had to raise mortgage rates to entice investors to keep liquidity in the system before the Fed raises rates. So by the time the Fed raised those rates, everybody's already reacted to it in the mortgage world. We've already seen our rates increase. And that's why I think we're coming back to another sideways pattern. And unfortunately, this part is where I'm prognosticating. I'm pulling out the crystal ball, reading the tea leaves, and it really comes down to why do I think we're going to see more of a sideways pattern? And what that does, as you see this happen to bonds, that means mortgage rates are settling in. They're finding an equilibrium. And it's just like water. If you pour water into a couple different tanks that are connected, it's going to adjust until it finds an equilibrium and a neutral point. And that's what I think we're finding with interest rates. Now, there's always going to be a range on what rate you get quoted. It's going to start with a starting point based on where this market is. But each lender is going to have different markets margins, different amounts of profit, different expenses. And they're, the rate that they offer you is going to differ slightly from lender to lender. And usually it's slightly, unless somebody is, uh, you know, for some reason, way out of the market. It's usually just a small variance. But then you're going to have differences based on your own personal circumstances, what loan program, whether you use a VA loan, which is a very good loan, whether you use uh, what they call conventional financing, which is going to require you to put more money down. But if you're not putting 20% down, you're going to generally see a slightly higher interest rate. There's more risk on those loans. Uh, you're going to see, you know, FHA loans that can be done where you can get a gift to for a down payment. And that's good for people that have not served and that need a lower down payment option. So depending on these different scenarios, you are going to see a rate of ranges, but ranges right now look like they are settling within somewhere within the fives. And when I say within the fives, we still see a variance you know, day to day or week to week based on what's going on with all of these variables, what's going on in the market, what's going on with bonds, with stocks. We look to the 10-year treasury yield. You could see that up here on this chart. We look to this as an indicator of which direction things are going and how things are reacting. The 10-year treasury is like the granddaddy of bonds. It doesn't directly impact your mortgage rates, but if we see that 10-year treasury yield getting better, that means generally mortgage rates could get better. And if we see that 10-year treasury yield going up, generally you're going to see mortgage rates follow. And we've seen that 10-year treasury yield go from in December, it was down around 1.5 and now it's up to three. It's doubled. Well, that's why we've seen mortgage rates also go up quite significantly in that time. So these are the different things that you can look at if you want to stay educated and informed and keep an idea, but don't put too much stock in trying to overanalyze, you know, well, hey, the 10-year treasury, uh, it was 2.96 right now when we're looking at it. And now it goes back up to 3.02 and oh no, my mortgage rate's going to go up in five minutes. It doesn't work necessarily that quickly, but it's a good overall idea of what's going on in the markets and how you can stay informed and, and seeing what direction things are headed. But Christopher, I, I do think we found an equilibrium. I, I enjoy hearing your thoughts on that. What do you think? Do you think rates are starting to settle in and that we'll see maybe, you know, rates will be low fives, maybe the higher fives, but generally staying within that range of the fives? Yeah, I was never real a, a big proponent of <clears throat> rates rising aggressively for a long period of time, only because 
I thought that the Fed would only would be limited in its action by the health of the economy, um, their dual mandate, right? Inflation and jobs. I think that at the point at which you see economics impacting jobs data um, or growth to some degree, they lessen their action. And traditionally, in periods of decline or recession, um, mortgage interest rates don't move upward, right? And in all of the recessions, there were only one of them where housing values declined during the recessions, and that was really because it revolved around it to some degree at least, right? But I think that where we're at right now is probably a pretty comfortable equilibrium. I think that you'll see some movement up and down. I think that no one should be too terrified or worried about where the mortgage interest rates are going or where they're at or letting that impact their long-term strategy. If you want to make a long-term strategy, look at long-term trends and try to see if there's some sort of some sort of meaningful long-term trend to say the 40-year history of mortgage interest rates. And if there's a long-term meaningful trend over 40 years, ask yourself if things are uh, changed or uh, different that would cause that trend to change, right? Only to say that I think the long-term trend is probably your friend, and I don't think that you have to worry a whole lot about uh, where things are at necessarily today outside of trying to make the best choice when you know that you're going to have to, meaning um, – if you know rates are moving upward really aggressively, then it would you know, somewhat benefit you to make a choice sooner rather than later. But never let that be the driver that makes you have to run or do things in a way where you're not sure you haven't had time to decide or analyze properly. Right. Um, I don't know. I think people freak out about rates and I don't get it. I've, we're, people buy houses regardless, even when rates are high. Um it impacts their cost to some degree, but at the same time, during those periods of time, inflation is usually at the same time when they're going up, inflation is usually pr going up pretty high as well. And I think mortgages and housing, I think housing where I put out an article was a good one. It said houses, uh, the house is the best asset uh, to abate inflation. I think a house with a mortgage, especially if you locked it in low, is one of the best mechanisms uh, to abate inflation. Um, as long as you have your capital or your values compounding kind of elsewhere. And that's why I'm a big fan of it. So if the rates fluctuate or change a little bit, don't let it bug you too much. They're going to go up. They're going to come down. Uh, they're going to move around. But I think that where we're at right now is probably a pretty decent equilibrium. I'd expect some up, some down kind of a thing, depending on how economy kind of goes. My big focal point right now is trying to follow the data that speaks to what Q2 is going to look like from a GDP standpoint. I'm looking at some of the manufacturing numbers, some of the jobs numbers, and those things to see <clears throat> will we actually uh, print negative again and be technically then in a recession. a recession. Yeah, well, yeah. like what we're in now, right? For me, when I'm looking around, I'm definitely seeing slowdown everywhere, thought to it everywhere. The housing economy, I think, is going to be fine. But the people that are waiting for a bubble, I think – I did a poll the other day, I asked, and I may do this in Veta VA just because it was kind of fun, but I said, put a, you may have saw it, said, put up a star for every 50K in housing equity that you have. And there were a lot of stars, folks. There were a lot of stars. A lot of people have a lot of equity. And so for a bubble to exist, you have to show loss. You have to show foreclosure. You have to show properties being sold for less. Um, and, you know, what's the circumstance then? To be exposed to a higher interest rate, a higher cost for housing, higher rent, all of those things. I don't think that you have an impending upset. I don't think you have an inventory issue. I don't think that you have anything other than an unhealthy housing market that hopefully will get a little more healthy with inventory, even if we go through some sort of economic downturn for a period of term. So buyers or homeowners, make sure you have extra liquidity, make sure you have access to liquidity, get your debt in order, your non-housing debt, make sure your housing debt's structured and smartly put together so that you're efficient, right? Debt is one of the most efficient currencies that you'll ever get to use. Um, it's the only one that really has a fixed measured cost uh, that you can uh, affix to an asset that actually appreciates your money, value fluctuates of your money every single day, right? Typically it does one thing and it's only ever done one thing and that's go down. Um, but get, get flexible. That's the most important thing to remember, I think, especially if you own a home, because you might get hit like my wife and I did the other day with air conditioner issues. And now we're going to replace air conditioners. And so that's not a cheap thing. And because I replaced an air conditioner under my first home buyer warranty or homeowner warranty, they didn't renew me for the second time. And I didn't go shop in the market to get a new homeowner warranty. And now I'm paying for an air conditioner replacement. So owning a house comes with expenses, right? You're going to spend money on these things. And a lot of people, um, I think an immature view only to say it's hasn't really gone through a full progression of the value from a house, but Immature view says that 
oh, houses have all these expenses. They suck. Well, you're going to have to put money into anything that you invest into almost always. The house is the one that is one of the only ones that is most assuredly guaranteed a certain measure of income or growth to the asset itself. Uh, and you're always going to have some sort of capital expenditures or hidden maintenance items or something else that you're going to be doing over the years. And you need to account for those, especially when you're going through an economic period where income or other things, gas prices may be high, right? All of these other things may be impacting your cash flow. You want to be able and capable. So Sorry, that was a little bit long-winded there. I've got a lot on my mind, man. There's a lot of concerns that people have out there. There are a lot of them that are like, hey, I want to access my home equity and do a cash out, but I've got a really low first mortgage, and so what's a HELOC kind of a thing? There are a lot of questions that borrowers have around not only the mortgage interest rates, but their homes, their values, and what they might want to do next. Absolutely. Yeah, I saw you guys were commenting on those. A couple of Facebook comments I want to deal with. So first one is, what is the the perception or speculation leading into August? A lot of speculation discussing concerns, a return to early 1980s pattern, raising rates, double digits, cooling off demands to housing markets. And I'll stop there and then we'll go to the second half. So the first part is, there is always the idea that history will repeat itself. However, we're so many different variables today versus what we saw in the 1980s. There is, I would say, a minusculely tiny, tiny, tiny chance that we will replicate what we saw in the late 70s and 80s, even with inflation and gas prices or different things. I don't think we have any concern of double digit mortgage rates. I don't think that we're going to see consistent six or 7% mortgage rates, let alone double digit. I think, like I said before, rates are settling in. And the Fed is taking aggressive action and they're telegraphing that action. And like we talked about a few minutes ago, the reason the Fed telegraphs their action, they're trying to let the markets acclimate to what the Fed is going to do rather than waiting until it happens and seeing a huge reaction that could upset the boat. You know, it's just like a boat sitting on the waves and the Fed wants to make as little waves as possible. They don't want to wake. It's a low wake zone. So they're trying to keep things calm. They telegraph it. They put little waves out there and the boats just kind of move like this rather than a big wave. So the Fed has already been very clear that they expect to raise rates by a half a percent in June, likely in July. The chance of them doing a three quarters of a point rate hike, which was really expected to happen in June just a few weeks ago, the Fed has been very clear that they have no intention of entertaining a three quarter point rate hike in the next couple of meetings. And that's off the table for now. So the markets have kind of prepared for what they think the Fed is going to do. The Fed has been very clear on that. And that's why the, the mortgage rates are starting to settle in. And, and we're not seeing rates go up and go up and go up and go up like we have for the last four months. So I don't think double digit rates are a concern. As far as cooling off the housing market, you know, I'm going to tie into something that Christopher said on the, before and then tie it into this question. Christopher talked about the equity and the fact of a housing bubble. In order for us to see the equity really start to disappear, we would have to see the inventory tremendously increase. There's a relationship where equity will remain unless there's more inventory than demand. And then that's when equity starts to fall because people have to lower their prices to get their houses sold. And it drives the pricing down. Well, even if we were to see rates go up, they've already gone up. But if we see them go up a little bit more, We've already proven that demand is still there. There is still multiple offer situations happening across America. There's bidding wars. There's people that are still paying way too much above asking price. First, we'll, we need to see that slow down. And we may see a little retracement in prices because some markets, we have driven prices up too quickly. We've gone up 20% the last couple of years, you know, consistently rising with, with rates, with um, um, equity rather, with home prices. We need to see that slow down, but we're not going to see a situation where there's a true cooling off to the housing market because there's too much demand. There are too many people that there's not enough inventory. They're not overbuilding. They learned a lot from 2008. And even on the, the other side of this demographic wave, they will have built slow enough into it. And not every house that gets built forever stays forever. A lot of them get dozed, get re renovated completely. Yeah. And so so a lot of the houses aren't always either. So even though we're having that housing growth, they're not overbuilding for the demand. So I think to, to argue a big bubble or big collapse in value is probably a little bit difficult, especially if you want to use any sort of uh, fundamental like data analysis or, yeah. or even like even if you want to show like or, or argue for the 80s, like show world economies 
um, outperforming the U.S. economy. Look at the global economy right now. And there are, um, many of the large economies are already moving into or already showing significant signs of recessionary environments even further along than us. Look at the value of the dollar. Um, the dollar's performed exceptionally exceptionally well here recently against other world currencies. It is strengthening and has been strengthening for a little bit now. The and so I think that haven, more yeah. than likely, yeah, I mean, honestly, it isn't crypto. It isn't gold. It's right. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's dollar. the dollar. And that's really showing its head. So I think to argue or to try to, to paint the picture of, well, these could be the circumstances. I think it'd be difficult to. Um, I don't know that that's the side I would take. I, that's why I say kind of follow the trend. I'm a favor, a fan of the trend, at least until major change happens and everyone's talking about oh, new world order. This, uh, well, OK, maybe, but I, I don't think so. I don't see it, um, at least in what's going on. I think people need to settle down. I'm not worried about those large types of world things that really don't impact their choice greatly and instead focus on the main thing that they need to focus on, which is shelter, housing. Yep. You want to talk about ridiculous growth? Do you know how good it's been to be a landlord these last 12, 24 months? Landlords out there rent because of the same shortage in housing and values and what people are having to pay to bring new rental properties to market and what they're having to get because capitalism, right? People don't do things because they have a desire to lose money or break even. They have to make a profit. It, right? Rent rate right now. If you're out there renting, um, pay attention. You may have to shop around and move a little bit. You're going to probably experience some continued increased growth of rent, even uh, if we go into kind of a recessionary period because the same fundamental shortage of shelter or housing exists uh, for the those assets as well. Um, but consider purchasing sooner rather than labor if you're able, but only when and if you're ready, really. Use this community as an avenue to learn and be educated on what home ownership looks like, what the values look like, how to go through it, how to prepare for it, you know, all of those things, because it'll help you and it'll serve your ability to be educated. Yeah. So, and the second part of that question, what's the thought as we roll into PCS season, some owners need to sell their low rate mortgage, having to purchase at a higher rate mortgage. That's all that's, that's always going to happen. And that ties into the other question, maybe the same person, people freak out about rates because they don't understand the balance between cost rate and demand variables. And that's true. But one thing I'll say about rates, rates, when it comes to mortgage rates, one thing that Christopher can attest to anybody in the mortgage spaces, we've been for years and, and years. When people are shopping around to get their mortgage, it, you're very aware of the rate. And then two years from now, if uh, we're in a conversation, I say, what interest rate you have? You're going to say, I, I don't know. I'd have to look at my statement. We don't really track that. What, what happens when rates are going up, it's not the affordability that's the only thing that comes into play. It's also our you know, fear of missing out. Nobody wants to overpay for something. I can't tell you how I wish that I would have bought real estate on the, you know, the sea coast. I'm on the East coast and we've got up and down the East coast. We've got, of course, the Atlantic ocean and we've got a lot of shoreline real estate. And there was a time 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, before I would have been able to, that I know people that were able to buy shoreline real estate at, you know, pennies on today's dollar. And yet you'd say, oh man, I missed my chance. You know, I, I would buy a house, but it's just it's expensive now. And I missed my chance and they'll come down in price and they're not, I'm still buying property today. I'm advising my kids to buy my daughter and my future son-in-law are looking to buy in, in, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of 2023. And I think that there is still a great thing because it's still a good opportunity. It's not as not as cheap as it was years ago, but it'll be cheaper than it will be years from now. I think we're still going to see rising rates or uh, okay. rising equity and rising costs. We all have a tendency now. to be cheap, right? All people like I do, like you have a tendency to be cheap and it's hard to anticipate what things are going to be worth tomorrow, really. I mean, most people under anticipate those types of things. So where we would all look today and go, man, must have been nice for grandpa to be able to buy this whole house for $3,500. If you were alive when your grandpa would have been, you'd been like 18%. Interest, this is outing percent. You know what I mean? There's yep. six one way, half dozen other, well, right? There's always well, cost to good in this. Things are expensive now. White goods, durable goods, air conditioners are expensive now. But when's the best time to buy an air conditioner, Christopher? Yesterday. <laughs> when, I mean, honestly, need anytime like in Texas, <laughs> in Texas, as soon as you need it. Yeah, I yeah. said when you like need the it. The proposition that's... of going through summer without an air—he's breaking up like, on no. me. 
Like, no. Yeah, up yeah, for the looks air like we lost like, him. Like, yes, I get. I'm gonna have to pay stupid. Oh no. He's back. Like, yeah. yeah, I get it. Yeah, with air conditioners in Texas. No, you're like, sign me up for stupid tax. I need it tomorrow, please. Yeah, we'll get you. So, all right, guys. Well, I, I call, think we're uh, we're at time, right? Yep. Perfect. Well done. And if anybody's got any follow up questions, just post them down below in the comments. Uh, Hammer, myself, Christopher, we track these, and we're happy to engage your questions as they come along. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>